So yeah, so um, my talk is maybe a little different in some ways, but I think it touches on a couple of things that uh, Gauta mentioned in his introduction, which is, you know, we have these models at different scales, whether it's point neurons and detail models, and the linkage between the two is, is sort of weak right now. And then the other, we've seen many interesting aspects in the other talks about uh, optimization and parameters. And uh, the thing that um, comes out very clearly is trying to use experimental data at many different levels and scales to constrain things, you know, because you could have the same output matching population firing, but the CSD, the LFP is not the same. And so, you know, there's, there's so many of these different aspects. One of the things that uh, made me choose this, this title for this presentation today was because it touches things in, in different ways. And so, as mentioned, I my title is Clarity in Model Development and Goals Leads to Model Linkages and Biological Insights. And so let me start by uh, seeing if I can advance my slides, yes. And so just a very brief outline. So first, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the hippocampus and theta oscillations and then theta oscillation models and then get into sort of uh, the biological, maybe it's the biological way in terms of how theta oscillations are generated or initiated and then have some concluding comments. And so, of course, I'm not going to talk about every single detail, but we're going to touch on sort of earlier work and very more recent work to sort of maybe bring about sort of aspects in the work that are not um, maybe fully appreciated or realized um, for, for those of you who are interested in data oscillation modeling. And so just to start uh, talking about the hippocampus, probably most of you, if not all of you, um, know all about the hippocampus, but just in case not, uh, I thought I would just sort of uh, say a few things about the hippocampus, which as we know, it's part of the medial temporal lobe. So here's sort of the human version and here's the rodent version. And of course, it's an intensely studied region for many regions. First of all, it's associated with memory and learning. It was one of the first places where LTP was measured. And we have a wide range of population activity, uh, activity patterns that are associated with many different uh, behavioral states. But of course, most importantly, why it's been heavily studied is it's amenable to experiment. So if you make a slice preparation, it retains its synaptic circuitry. And here I'm just showing a couple of recordings from uh, behaving animals during a wake and slow wave sleep to, to show you sort of the different kind of activities that one sees. So here in the top, we have this theta uh, rhythmic activity, three to 12 Hertz. And then during slow wave sleep, you'd see large irregular activity or sharp waves. So I think uh, nowadays um, it's pretty clear because of excellent work that has gone on in many labs around the world that these theta rhythms in particular are represent some sort of functional unit because they clearly represent some kind of phase coding uh, just in the schematic to illustrate here. You have these sequence theta sequences in the hippocampus uh, during spatial memory operation. So as the animal's moving through space and as it goes to different locations, you have this processing uh, activity of these place cells. And it was um, many, uh, almost 20 years ago now that a proposed function for the theta rhythm uh, was given by Hasselbo and colleagues in terms of separate phases of encoding and retrieval. And this is a schematic from their paper from many years ago, just showing that during the encoding, which is um, uh, occurring during sort of this trough, if the EEG is measured at the Fisher region, you have this sort of strengthening in input coming in from uh, sensory input. So you have strengthening of input, interrhinal input. And during retrieval of memories during the peak, this is sort of weakened. And this proposal seems to, you know, I think it's clear this is what's going on because, for example, uh, recent work from Siegel and Wilson uh, really showed that this is a phase specific code. That is, if they manipulate uh, the theta rhythm during phase or trough times, they can actually get enhancement of the encoding or retrieval function in the hippocampus. So this is, you know, just all to sort of bring home sort of the importance of this theta rhythm and just to sort of show some aspects associated with the theta rhythm. I mean, I know there's definitely people here who know a lot more than me about this, but this is to serve the whole audience here. Um, so we have this ongoing uh, theta oscillation and what you all, what you see is sort of this higher frequency gamma activity so during movement exploration. So in this example slide. And the other thing to bring about is when we talk about theta rhythms, it's not just some generic theta rhythm, there's different types, in particular high and low frequency range that is uh, brought about induced by different types of stimuli, whether it's social or fearful stimuli. So the lower uh, frequency theta range three to seven versus seven to 10 Hertz been referred to as type one, type two, theta oscillations, type two is the lower frequency one. 
And in some other studies, it has been shown that in particular, certain cell types could be causal for a type two theta oscillation. The other point to mention is, of course, most of these studies are done in rodents uh, for obvious reasons, but we do have these theta oscillations in the human to medial temporal lobe. And here's just showing some uh, theta oscillations in three different patients from this work. And the main difference uh, that one has between sort of that one sees between the rodent and the human is sort of the intermittency. So it's sort of a continual sort of rhythm in the rodent, but it's more intermittent, but it does exist there in the same functional role. So all of that is sort of to uh, bring me to this comment also from this more recent uh, review, which is a really nice read. Um, I particularly enjoyed it because there's so much terminology in the field. And so when one talks about ventral and dorsal in rodents, but in human, people talk about posterior anterior. And so they have some really nice figures in this review. But this, um, what they bring about here in terms of the hippocampus, the structure and the details associated with it, is that there's sort of this uh, uh, dichotomic view in terms of the dorsal hippocampus being important in the memory spatial aspects and the ventral more in anxiety related. So that sort of harks back to that uh, earlier if I just mentioned in passing with the type two oscillation. But fast forward to present day where there's a lot more data and experimental uh, insight in terms of sort of this, this fantastic structure. So if you look at uh, sort of genetic, intrinsic and extrinsic kind of connectivity, it seems clear that this dichotomous view is maybe uh, too simplified. Gene expression studies have showed like this actually a tripartite uh, division and it's the ventral one third in terms of the uh, ventral side of the hippocampus that's, uh, where the intrinsic connectivity sort of has sort of this different role and the in extrinsic side is sort of more the sort of gradient. And so um, what's been said in these studies, um, you know, bringing together many of these studies in this excellent review is that we have sort of, we could think about this sort of functional long axis gradient superimposed on sort of discrete functional domains. And so all this understanding and data and information that we're sort of that has been gathered in sort of the hippocampal structure sort of help us sort of tease apart and understand how to focus our uh, modeling studies. At least this is how I sort of view it. So all of this sort of is to say is that there are various rhythms, the theta rhythms to consider. It's not a, a you know, just a theta rhythm. And in this end ending of this sort of uh, blathering on my part about the hippocampus is sort of this older review from Buzaki to sort of show that in the intact brain or in the in the brain where you have lesion in the entorhinal cortex, you have theta rhythm with or without the entorhinal cortex. So this is just sort of, you know, if you look at sort of the current source density, that it's there in many different capacities. And so what we really have to sort of uh, be aware of in doing any of these models is what is it we're actually going to have a clear sense of the context when we ask the question of how the theta rhythms are generated. So of course, any of us, all of us in the computational neuroscience field have this problem, right? It's a multi-scale problem. And as was really nicely sort of um, expressed in that review by uh, Gautier and, and colleagues about simulations, we really need to have them to sort of figure out what's going on, but we really have to try to take advantage of experimental data at all these different levels. And so in the context of theta uh, rhythms, of course, because they're, you know, been heavily studied, there's of course exist many different models for them. And some years ago, Katie and I had sort of summarized a lot of these existing models in, the, in um, one of the computational neuroscience encyclopedias. And this is just to sort of give you a, a taste of, of sort of existing models that are out there. <clears throat> in this uh, schematic, uh, there's sort of three cell types, and this is taken from Wolf et al. It builds on earlier work from uh, Nancy Coppell and colleagues, where there's sort of three cell types. You have the fast firing uh, I cells, the pyramidal E cells, and what they're called O cells, which are essentially OLM or sort of the slow firing uh, inhibitory cell types. And how we summarize it here with the different uh, uh, references is what cell types were included, the number of compartments in each of the cell models, the size of the network, the different connections. And you know, of course there's details associated with each of these um, uh, well done modeling studies. But the point here is um, as Katie sort of outlined in this article is when we're sort of building these models is the multi-scale aspect, but what cell type should we include? How should we model these individual cells? How is the network connected? How many cells should you use to represent a population? And so getting back to this key question, essentially this opportunity arose several years ago 
uh, because of work from Silva and Williams lab. So um, again, just to sort of give the context, because I want to sort of focus on uncertain aspects of multi-scale. <clears throat> and so this, this work got me very excited back then because here was an in vitro whole hippocampus preparation spontaneously expressing theta oscillations such that one, and because of the series of experiments that they did, they could say that the theta oscillations were due to the coupling of multiple autonomous oscillators. So in other words, you had sort of a, a chain of oscillators that were expressing theta rhythms. So this allowed us to sort of like hone in on the sort of size of network that was required and also is in the CA1 or distal CA1 subiculum region. So that was exciting and we took advantage of this. So this is work is published. So I'm not gonna go through it in detail, but I'm trying to sort of give you the sequence and the thoughts behind the point I want to make, <laughs> which hopefully will be clear. Um, so many studies, um, previous papers were done to sort of allow us to come to this sort of combination work of theoretical modeling and experimental work to sort of try to explain how intrinsic or the intrahippocampal theta oscillations are generated. And so the questions that I mentioned before about well, what cell types include, well, uh, we included just see if we could get away with just including two types. So the pyramidal cells and the fast firing PV cell types, which of course encompass many different uh, cell populations. How to model the individual cells came directly from the experimental data in terms of having a biological linkage, how the network is connected again uh, for this known in the literature, how many cells are need to represent population. So this is where we sort of took very strong advantage of the strategy of, oops, yeah, where we took exactly, we focused tightly on this context of this intrinsic or intrahippocampal theta rhythm. So the number of cells that we use in this network was exactly what would be, well, not exactly, was approximated from a one cubic millimeter, which seemed to be able to spontaneously express this theta rhythm. So that together with leveraging different theoretical insights and development models and extensive power to variation allowed us to come with an explanation of how this theta was theta rhythm was generated in this sense. And again, I'm not, you can look at the paper for details, but <clears throat> what I want to bring about is around the same time, there was um, another work uh, by Marian Bezer and colleagues of also of a full, of a CA1 circuit, but in this case, it was a full scale model. So here there's 300,000. So they worried about the number of cells, uh, the cell types, but here they have eight different types of inhibitory cells and the pyramidal cells, of course, and it was generating theta oscillations, theta gamma. So if you look at the RAS support here, for example, the prompt cell, you see the ongoing theta rhythm and sort of the FASTA gamma. And it was loosely based on the whole hippocampus preparation in the sense that in our models, whereas here, there was not sort of incoming oscillatory drive. The model in itself was generating the theta rhythm. So basically we had this uh, comparable context that allow us to really think about how to bring these models together. And so this sort of harks back to what um, uh, Gaute was mentioning in the beginning about the leaks being, links being weak. So hopefully we made a little strong link uh, is the hope. So this work was just recently published and uh, Alexandra sort of uh, pioneered this sort of linkage. And really I want to mention a couple of things here. It's always a balance. You know, when you're doing the model and you're trying to figure out the parameters and estimate from the experimental data, it's always going to be some balance of parameters that's going to, you know, bring about what you're looking at. Here, we're talking about theta rhythms. But here we have the opportunity of this quote unquote well defined biological context in two different types of models, what we call minimal and a detailed model here. Um, and so each of them have pros and cons. So, of course, our model is minimal. So even though we have an explanation within the context of our model of how the theta rhythm is generated because of characteristics and you know, the balance that we associated with spike green adaptation, all the rest of it, it's not like we could just map that directly onto the biology. First of all, we only have the two cell types. And so in terms of exactly what that balance or what those parameters value aren't sort of like a one-to-one -one correspondence. I mean, there's no dendrites and all the rest of it in our models. On the other hand, but we do have some kind of balance in this model that is generating the theta rhythms that we understand in the model. Here we have this detailed model, which is beautiful in terms of producing this theta rhythm with the different cell types and the phasing and stuff that you can measure. But because of this sort of complexity and the high dimensional of the system, it's very hard to sort of untangle how it's actually generated in this model. So basically in this work, what we did was we linked these two to try to sort of reveal what's going on. So 
we think of this as the biological proxy, the linkage that Alexandra did um, together with Melissa and myself to sort of bring this linkage, I think sort of speaks to really how this, this rhythm is sort of initiated. I think we could so potentially say that. So what I want to sort of bring home is what is there in the papers, but is maybe sort of under the hood, so to speak, unless you're sort of looking for it, is um, the following. So I'm just gonna give you a taste and there's details in the paper and I'm happy to answer questions. So in our minimal models, we had developed these PV cell networks, fast firing PV cell network, plant cell networks, and we put it together in the EI cell networks. In developing the cell models, they had a clear biological linkage. We use Isakivish, and you know, we could use an adaptive uh, firing, but we use this sort of represent mathematical representation for the individual cells, but were parameters that were directly based on data from the pyramidal and PV cells in that whole hippocampus preparation. So those are essentially these parameter values. And this is just showing you what uh, one set of experimental data is and one set of model data looks like. But the other aspect that um, I want to sort of uh, bring home is this connection. So in doing the initial PV cell model, and this is just taken from that earlier work. So here's the FI curve and the black is the model and the rest are sort of experimental data. And this is showing here. What we also had access to because of the in vitro preparation is the ongoing rhythm. So here's the LFP of the ongoing rhythm and here's the firing of a, fast, of a PV fast firing cell. So what Katie did was um, because of having this data, she could look, uh, uh, look at what the frequencies of the PV cell was during the ongoing rhythm. And because of having the FI curve model, map it down to how much drive these cells need to get during the ongoing rhythm. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this I applied value is not just a bifurcation parameter that is often used, actually has a meaning of an estimate of how much input these PV cells are going during this ongoing population activity. And, you know, basically, you know, did the whole uh, inhibitory network and you can get uh, coherent firing or not coherent firing depending on the balance of the parameters. So because of that, when we put this EI cell network together, we weren't sort of, um, uh, um, we took away the I applied input because now we have the input that it's getting is actually from the pyramidal cell, but because we're using the correct network, appropriate network size, as it turned out, the excitatory drive that the PV cells are, were receiving and the 500 is approximately what you'd have in that slice actually matched experimental data in terms of the excitatory drive it'd be getting. So that, in other words, the balance was there in the system. And um, this, I mean, we talk about this in our papers, but it's you know not something to focus on. But why it's important is because it's always about balance of parameters and uh, the context that you're looking at. So this I'm not gonna talk about in detail, but because of having this sort of minimal model, we sort of uh, uh, leverage it to look at sort of a hypothesis development of the frequency of how it was generated. What I do wanna talk about here in the time that I have is the link back to the detailed model. Uh, the work that Alexander just published. So this, this uh, work, as I mentioned before, the parameters in this detailed model that um, Bezer and uh, et al. did came from model cell numbers and connectivity. So the, the structural connectivity was uh, a huge amount of work that was previously published in 2013, sort of this knowledge base of bringing all this data together and then creating the whole full-scale model structure of it. So it was a tour de force. Um, but the way that, so that's in terms of cell number, so it's about 300,000 plus uh, cells in, in the CA1 model and the different layers and the connections in the appropriate layer, layer dependent fashion. Uh, each cell model was multi-compartment, but it was really only the pyramidal cell that sort of had a full detailed um, uh, morphological structure. Um, you know, this of course helps in terms of bringing about the LFP output from the model, which is important. And the other inhibitory cells also multi-compartment in a minimal, minimal fashion. In terms of matching electrophysiology, here's a comparison that they did with the experimental data and their model. And this is in the appendix. I'm just showing you a snapshot, for example, of the resting mean potential, the threshold and the spike amplitude of, um, of the comparison of the model and the uh, um, experimental data. So what was a big deal um, in terms of trying to do th this linkage or in doing this linkage was how actually to dissect out this detailed model exploration. So as I mentioned, we had this um, explanation from a minimal perspective of how the theta was generated and we had this detailed model. And so if we could sort of make links, which is essentially what we did in this paper, we could now sort of think about it from a bi biological perspective of how this theta uh, was generated or initiated. And so again, um, this is published, so I'm not gonna dive into all the details, 
But suffice it to say, uh, we, by linking these two or looking at these two models side by side in terms of connectivity and cells and inputs and all the rest of it, um, we essentially, uh, or Alexandra essentially took a piece or slice, a segment model as she called it, so that the cell numbers were analogous to that piece that we knew in, from Silva and Zeta could generate theta rhythms. And this is what uh, you're showing here. So basically she just cut out a piece. So when she cut out a piece, you know, you have the, you know, all the different cell types connected in the particular ways that were based on the earlier studies. And here's the unfiltered LFP output, which you see is quite noisy, but you do have this sort of theta rhythm that is in that piece. So it's sort of nice to see, well, okay, if we have this sort of biologically detailed model in this piece, you know, like the experimental data is generating theta. But as I, as I mentioned, it's noisy and as the power is less than what you see in the experimental data. But now, because of this sort of comparison, the linkage with the middle model, we knew what parameter sets to focus on to extract out what could be going on in terms of getting this theta rhythm in this detailed model. And again, um, I'm not gonna sort of give you all the details here today, but suffice it to say, there was a parameter parameter connection and the excitatory drive coming into the system that where the differences between the minimal and detailed model lay. And so what Alexandra did was did a huge amount of simulations on this segment, so 30,000 rather than 300,000. So of course that makes a huge difference in, uh, <laughs> in simulation. Um, but what she did, um, it's a high dimensional system, many parameters we expect of course to be to have the de degeneracy in the system. And this was clearly exposed by looking at, looking through a range of this uh, um, uh, stimulation input and parameter parameter connections. What you're seeing on the left here is a normalized theta power, the theta, frequency that you're getting for these sets of uh, different pairs of parameters and the stimulation that's required in order to get the theta frequency. Um, so, so degeneracy is there, not surprisingly. And what we can very safely say or very comfortably say in this piece that is generating theta rhythm is that it emerges from the parameter cell population. So here's, I'm just showing you sort of the uh, filtered theta output from the, in this case, 30,000 parameter cells, generating theta frequencies in many ways. Um, and if you look at the input to this, you know, to several individual parameter cells, you see that there's no rhythmic input actually coming into the parameter cell population. This is just showing uh, the input currents of the different cell types and um, the simulation here, and then you can do spectral analysis and there's no uh, rhythmic activity coming into there, but yet you have this theta rhythm coming out. Let me just jump here. Um, so here's two different sets of parameters producing robust theta rhythms, uh, case A, case B, as we called it. And so you have this theta rhythm here. And if you look at the raster plots of case A and case B, and let's look at the parameter cell, which is this row here, you see that there's this, this, this bursting, this, pop, this theta frequency bursting coming out of the parameter cell population. So that's when you look at the LFP is clearly where it's coming from, in this case, but the, excite, the inhibitory cells are firing in different ways because of the different pathways that are emphasized in this uh, degenerate forms. But there's no, uh, the inhibitory drive, the inhibitory input does not have any sort of organized theta rhythm that is you know, contributing to this population output. So we can very comfortably say in the system, in the segment, in this piece is that this theta rhythm is initiated from the parameter cell population. So let me just go back here. So it is because of having enough connectivity, enough size. So it's very important the size and the amount of connectivity between the parameter cells that can initiate this. So size matters, <laughs> as they say. Um, and so I think, it's, uh, I, I, I think it's not unreasonable to talk about a hippocampus hub, which has actually been used in sort of imaging studies in that the, the hippocampus in and itself can initiate this theta rhythm. Now, of course, you need the whole large network and the inhibitory cell to sort of make it a sort of a robust rhythm because we're sort of looking at a segment. And of course, you need middle septal input and extrinsic connection to other places. But I think through this sort of linkage of these different models, we could, we could perhaps you know, reasonably say that it is this initiation, this spark from the parameter cell population of where the state rhythm is actually coming from and then contributions in many ways in terms of the tuning and regular regularization. Um, so I think that's not unreasonable to say and talk about a pacemaker circuit. The story is far from finished, but this sort of um, 
initiation idea allows us sort of to put the rest of it together. And so I didn't keep track of my time. So I have my concluding comments, um, which I want to take a little bit of time. And so I know Juliana, I've met, never met in person, but I, I really like this paper of theirs. And I think she's wanted to speak in other days, um, wrote what I think is a really interesting article some years back. And within this article, they talk about how do we know what biophysical details matter for circuit performance? And of course, as we all know, models are always wrong. Um, as they fail to contain all the actual biology machinery that is either we don't know about it or is considered to be less important. So, I mean, how many of our cells have glia in it, for example? Um, so, what it's, uh, what we what my title, my talk, and sort of what I'm trying to sort of um, convey here is that if we can kind of have this well-defined context as we did here and take advantage of it and bring it together we could perhaps move a little bit closer to getting to the, this direct biological insight and where and how to focus and develop hypotheses. So then that takes me to sort of my uh, last comment, uh, closing comment here, which is uh, yet another statement that I, I love very much from when I read it the first time. And this is from an editorial of Anne Churchill and Larry Abbott. And Larry said he was responsible for this particular sentence which is that global understanding when it comes will likely take the form of highly diverse panels loosely stitched together in a patchwork quilt. And so this is how I think about multi-purpose network models, uh, <laughs> which is that, you know, we have all these sort of different pieces, we have these different type of models. And so trying to sort of, um, sort of be uh, very transparent and clear about sort of the representation and the context we're talking about, we could sort of make these linkages. So the stitching of these, diverse panels, potentially because they're representing, you know, OLM cells in slightly different ways, um, they have to be stitched together because they, each of these models are giving us something in different ways. And so in, in the way I think about it is this is how we could potentially get towards these multipurpose network models and understand what's going on in the biological system. And so I haven't, I meant to put my timer on, so I don't know where I'm with time, but I'm actually at the end of my talk. Um, I probably talked a little bit faster than I intended, but, um, uh, I just want, get... okay all right so I just want to acknowledge all mm. past and present lab members and collaborators and then specifically for the things I mentioned today mm. Alexandra and Katie and Sylvan of course for the preparation of course our, our institute for support and and funding and computing and all the rest of it and so I will end there and hopefully this was um, uh, helpful interesting and I look forward to any questions and discussions you might have mm. thank you